I guess we're just going to start. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome our uh, speakers for this evening, Lynn Rice and Astrid Lipka. Uh, Lynn Rice, as some of you might know, is the visiting critic in the New York space um, that we have in, in the city. And um, I want to say that, that Lynn Rice are, are, are really exciting, emerging young firm that are at an, an incredibly interesting moment in their practice. Um, they're widely recognized for their ability to engage the public with contemporary built works that emerge from fresh programmatic and formal speculations um, and integrate new construction techniques and materials. They've developed an iterative design approach that takes pleasure in teasing out the unexpected potential of projects by inventively embracing their practical constraints and also working extensively through collaborations. The firm has collaborated intensely with artists, designers, programmers, curators, innovators of all sorts, professionals, merging design, um, merging diverse working methods to create architectural projects that really pushed the boundary. Um, Rice was previously a partner at Open Office where he was a principal and, and the architect of record for one of the world's largest contemporary art museums. If you haven't been there, please do visit um, Dia Beacon. It's, a, it's a really one of the most incredible um, art museums that you, you can find. Um, he was selected as one of the architectural leagues um, uh, architectural league of New York's emerging voices for 2002 and named as the 2003 Design Vanguard by Architectural Record. Rice serves on the board of directors for the Architectural League of New York and has taught at Princeton, Cooper, Bernard, Columbia, and now Syracuse. Um, prior to work to moving to the U.S., um, Astrid Lipka worked with uh, Bote Richter Tehrani um, architects in Hamburg. She has worked extensively with Rice as an associate at Open Office on a range of museum uh, and cultural projects. And uh, both um, Lynn and Astrid hold master's degrees in, in advanced architectural design from Columbia, although they were six years apart. Um, their work has been, um, has received numerous awards and um, they have also built intensely uh, a kind of art exhibition museum related uh, practice along with all kinds of other um, building typologies. Um, but there's one project that I would like to single out which is the redesign of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. Hopefully they'll, they'll show us some of that. Um, that in, and they've collaborated with that, uh, with, with, on that project with James Corner. And one of the, the things that the jury cited was that the project is, creates an inspirational, it's an inspirational project that, that combines the past and the present in a, in a kind of well-resolved uh, and convincing manner as Lynn Rice said, we want to have it all. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Rice Lipka. Thank you, Saroj, primarily for calling us young. Um, it's good to be here at Syracuse, and especially, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with the students down in uh, Manhattan in the, in the New York program. Uh, Astrid and I have a small office in lower Manhattan that we run with Benjamin Cadena, our associate, uh, and we consider ourselves, uh, say, inspired pragmatists. Um, I guess, like all architects, we seek opportunities encoded within uh, project briefs. Uh, however, as what Sarah Whiting and Bob Semmel have called new pragmatists, we share uh, Bernard Schumi's provocative uh, a picture of Bernard. Yes. Uh, provocative, say, masochistic uh, assessment that the tighter the constraints, the greater the pleasure. Uh, in other words, we like it. Uh, so, uh, and in a way, the people and organizations that hire us do bind us and there are sometimes uh, twisted and contradictory uh, constraints. Uh, and then they expect us to do something amazing with them. 
But in fact, this resistance uh, of the givens do provide us with something to test, something to push off of. In fact, we've never uh, felt more uncomfortable than we were when we were hired to do a project with no client, a speculative house that was to be sold after it was designed, uh, along with 99 other houses uh, in the middle of the Mongolian desert. Uh, something, some part of our work was lost there, the pleasure of interpreting and manipulating the constraints of the project. Uh, rather than being bound up in constraint, we were actually somehow uh, left naked to uh, fend for ourselves with no problems to solve, no particular need for invention. Um, ultimately, we realized that we can conceptualize this lack of information itself, and we were able to base a project on that. So we, we worked to strip away access to help untangle complex issues, and yet we conversely retangle ourselves by questioning whether some of the perceived access might actually have critical performative characteristics. So we document and accumulate everything and discard nothing. Uh, we work not so much to reveal a mythical essential core of a project, but rather to expose that what, what is thought of as essential is maybe, is maybe not, and maybe even standing in the way of innovation. So we equally and actively question the normative assumptions of what constitutes access and essence. We try to identify the hidden and unarticulated desires that are behind the set of articulated constraints. And we then speculate about the different ways we might satisfy those desires, either through the clarity or cleverness of how a project is conceived or how it looks, but mostly in what it does. As Stan, Stan Allen puts it, um, how a project operates in and on the real world. So we work tactically to seek these hidden opportunities and their effects, the effects not anticipated or defined by the project brief. These are the secondary or side effects that can propel or amplify a given program um, into newer innovative territory. What makes this process fascinating to us is the range of conceptual uh, approaches that can get you there to provoke innovative side effects or even offer productive insights after the fact. I was recently asked to give a talk on our work um, kind of through the lens of the theme of absence, which is not something we concentrate at all on in our office. However, it was actually enlightening. Absence is not absolute. It can be intermittent. Uh, it can be uh, uh, very subtle or diluted, or it can be uh, quite profound and even shocking. Uh, this Joseph Boyce piece, for example, for shocking to me, uh, stacks, large stacks of felt in a gallery that absolutely absorb all the ambient sound in the room. As you walk between them, your head actually feels like it's just been introduced to a vacuum of space. So the important thing is that the normative experience is disrupted and something new is learned from that uh, experience. These objects fill the gallery spatially, um, physically but they empty it orally, so one's sense of sound and silence is profoundly expanded. So it seemed to me that the perception of absence is made possible through presence in a way, uh, and maybe in the way that light is reliant on form, surfaces, atmospheres to reveal it. Turning the thought around, um, for every presence one can imagine, there must be an associated absence that accompanies that, a kind of silent companion and if we could be conscious of this companion in our own work, of what our projects are not, uh, and if we could be as articulate and uh, uh, specific about what we've intentionally excluded, uh, the idea is that we might understand our expanding in ways that could encourage invention. So we work iteratively and um, we produce and test many alternatives for, pro for alternatives for projects. And at the end of the design process, the reality is that um, that only one variation or alternative or scheme actually gets realized. This is very sad. <laughs> <laughs> so this way, there's always much, much more evidence of what the project conceptually is not than what it is. But of course, there's, um, so these are the silent companions of, um, of what our projects actually are. 
But of course, there's also a tremendous amount of evidence of what the projects ac actually are, including the build form itself. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, quite a number of projects, but I'm pretty sure that we can get it in under an hour. We'll be going increasingly fast, so accelerating through it. Um, projects will get uh, smaller. We'll start with uh, Dia Beacon, our largest project, which is uh, located about 90 minutes north of Manhattan. It's an old Nabisco factory, uh, which we converted into one of the world's largest contemporary art museums, about 300,000 square feet, 192,000 square feet of sky, uh, whoops, of skylights uh, that you all uh, that you see here on uh, the first level that was required for the printing processes. They printed the boxes there at this plant formally. We started the process by uh, examining uh, some of the work of the artists of uh, Dia. This is for their permanent collection. So we looked at the works of Judd, Sarah, um, Heiser, and uh, Sandback. Uh, and we, they all share this decisiveness, a, a timelessness, and a sense that only the essential is, presence, uh, is present. The contexts then uh, are, in a way, silent yet significant companions uh, in the work's reading in a way that relates to the partnership of absence and presence I just described a minute ago. Uh, so we knew from the outset that what would be required would be this architecture of what uh, our colleague Yehuda Safran uh, observed as uh, an architecture of nothing, uh, but nothing with absolute precision. Uh, at the time, our office was called uh, Open Office. And uh, I, with my three former partners, uh, along with uh, the artist Robert Irwin, uh, started looking at the exterior surrounds of the project. And the first uh, thing we really did was to separate out group traffic from individual traffic, uh, dropping off groups with the cafe, the kind of uh, profane space in a way, and everyone else enters into the more sacred space of the art. This uh, entering through uh, a kind of hybrid tree grove and parking lot uh, that is, uh, creates a seasonal veil. These trees hold a, um, uh, they're flowering, they hold a berry in the winter. So the idea is that every time you visit Dia and their permanent collection that doesn't change so often, you yourself can have a different experience. And uh, we've actually had the experience that the weather conditions, time of year, all have uh, an impact on your experience. We as architects, it's good to collaborate with people outside the profession, like artists, they, they think differently. We were so um, interested in making a big lobby for this 300,000 square foot museum. We were you know, salivating over this prospect. And uh, Bob said, you know, why don't we think about the exterior forecourt as the lobby? Um, and we were like, that's a really good idea. People have been cooped up in Manhattan and they ride the train up, and now they're in the beautiful uh, Hudson Valley. So why not uh, treat the exterior as the lobby? So we actually compacted the entry to a very, very constricted passage, so small, in fact, that you can only enter the museum essentially one at a time. And once you enter, uh, we situated it such that you enter on the end of an existing uh, demising wall, uh, and you're forced with this, you, you know, you have this kind of pseudo existential moment where you have to choose between going into the left gallery or the right gallery. But there is no right or wrong. There is just left and right. And, uh, but the point is that you make a decision, that you enter the gallery somehow engaged with the work and one-on-one -on -one with it uh, and not chatting with your friends going in. So it's kind of a very serious take on observing art. We conceived of that passage as being very, very uh, moody, shaded in contrast to the galleries within. So when you come in, Actually, uh, it seems almost brighter than the daylight outside. So it's, it's an enormous building, and it's comprised out of three major art compartments um, that you can yep. find in yourself. Um, I'm the Carol Merrill. It's, <laughs> it's about um, 80,000 square feet, and accompanied by a train shed. That's where the um, trains used to go in and be um, loaded with the, with the boxes that were shipped off to Manhattan to the High Line and the um, Chelsea Market Building where the Saltines and the Oreos were, were made. Um, and there's also an admini a small administrative building um, at, the, uh, at the one corner with a cafe, bookstore, and some offices. Our, our apartment fits in one bay. It's very sad also. <laughs> to untangle circulation and to make sure that, how can I get my screen? I think it's wiggle this. Wiggle that. 
tap this. I want to do the wrong thing. Um, no, my screen went off. Maybe you can use this to look at the camera. I guess. Oh. I did. Sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. Put the wall. You here? Oh, yeah, oh, so we're, uh, no, we're here. Yeah, so it's a, to make sure, oh, um, to untangle circulation and to make sure that people can stay oriented within, um, within that uh, huge building, um, we created these gallery, um, gallery islands where, um, that, that were for, um, for paintings that only received indirect north light from the skylights. And then around those islands were situated the, um, the sculpture, was situated the sculptural, sculptural work that received direct east and west light and, and also the north um, indirect light. Um, and you, you can see on the painting side, we, um, we had flat wall surfaces, whereas on the sculpture side, we articulated the columns um, to, yeah. Um, I'm a little lost. <laughs> so we, we spent a lot of time on simple details, like where exactly we should, um, we should end the top of the wall um, in relation to this exist existing structure. And because each decision um, extended throughout the entire building, each decision was really a huge decision. So we mo mocked up several variations of where the wall could be, including all the way up into the skylights, but realized that, um, that the idea to keep the walls under the beams um, and let the skylight continue over it would um, give a better sense of, of the entire shed. And we specified new white roofing material to maximize the amount of light that is being reflected into the spaces. Um, and you can see that in the next slide um, here, you can see the direct west light and the indirect um, north light on the Chamberlain sculptures. And the building has a tremendous amount of glass and we preserved all of it to, um, we preserved all the delicate steel frames, but actually um, replaced the glass and obta obtained um, locally, locally manufactured glass that, that um, helps to maintain a sense of interiority with a focus on the art. So we did not completely deny the outside, um, rather we left an impression of it and combined it um, with a limited opportunity to view the exterior surrounds. Uh, in the back building that is the south uh, building, we did have the same strategy of bouncing as much light off the white roof as possible. You see here the light coming in. We also had uh, maple flooring throughout the building. It was heavily damaged in this area with the ink uh, from the printing process. So we poured a new concrete slab, which was the right context for these uh, Donald Judd plywood boxes. And then we were able to salvage enough of it to repair the floor in uh, uh, the north two buildings. We worked with Arup to nestle uh, up on the roof all the mechanical uh, systems uh, between these skylights and shoot air uh, directly out into the galleries via high velocity diffusers so there's no exposed ductwork in the museum at all. Uh, in the back is a little more complex, uh, rooting exterior insulated ductwork on top and then dumping that air into thickened walls and allowing it to kind of just leak out the top, all in an effort to create a context for works like Fred's Handback which is just so delicate, it really benefits from every bit of distraction that you can erase from um, its uh, field. We digitally modeled the space and physically modeled it for the curators uh, to help them uh, situate the works in the space, uh, which they did in collaboration with uh, all the living artists of the collection. And then they, once we found out where works were intended to be, we worked to prepare the architecture to support the installation of that work. This is the most uh, uh, kind of involved uh, part of the project where we cut open the back of that back building to provide a column-free spa uh, space for uh, the Judd sculptures. So there's quite a lot of work involved with doing nothing with uh, absolute precision. Uh, the Heiser sculptures, uh, we worked with the artists to install their projects and pour our slab basically right up to the edge of the Heiser Void sculptures. Uh, this was situated in the southeast corner of the museum against uh, Beacon Mountain, which is right here the one place where the ground plane aligns with the interior floor plate uh, in the back of the museum. Uh, so this is the one place also that we use clear glass so the connection is made for what was conceived of as an earthwork. We uh, collaborated with uh, Richard Serra to 
uh, calibrate the, perfor uh, the proportions of the train shed space to get the right amount of compression over the, for the torque to ellipses. The reading of monumentality really depends on that. Uh, each of these pieces weigh about 13 tons, and each ellipse is made of three pieces, so something like 39 tons each. And I love, this is Sarah's uh, situating the torque to ellipses on our plan, uh, which I love the kind of implied casualness of that. And of course, then there were 30 people, art assistants, measuring you know, to the tenth of an inch uh, where those pe pieces were actually placed in real uh, space. So. Uh, at Beacon, the artists and the artworks uh, were totally privileged, and our, all architectural matters were uh, viewed as secondary. And the entire architectural project, one could say, was marginalized. But for us, the tactical partnering of uh, these precisely edited spaces, materials and light, with specific works of art, constitute a very singular experience uh, that some have described as approaching the sublime. The very architectural restraint and rawness amplify the art, uh, but more importantly, join with it to create a kind of art space and a sense of permanence. Uh, for us, it's a, a measured architecture in which all that is included and excluded is essential. So shifting to New York now, we designed a new home for Parsons the New School for Design. Parsons found itself in a really strange situation. It was a vital and creative institution at the center of urban, active urban life in the middle of, the, uh, of Greenwich Village. But it was somehow completely cut off from the city that surrounded it. And even the four adjacent buildings that comprise this campus were separated from each other with no sense of place or common space or um, identity. So we were asked by Parsons to help reconnect with the city and to create a new contemporary identity for the school. And the next slide is uh, one of the existing buildings. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a little behind. Um, this is one of the existing buildings at 13th Street and, and Fifth Avenue. And you can see how it is hidden in the urban fabric and visually closed off from the street. And it was no mystery that nobody knew where, where Parsons actually is. Uh, and so we immediately went on to work on, to, on creating this facade and um, that involved complex facade and storefront, uh, did many iterations. But, and it was, it was really exciting to be called on by, um, by such an important design school to, to create their new identity. But we pretty quickly realized that, that this approach was completely flawed and that the problem was the very idea of attempting to apply an identity to the complex. So rather than creating a facade that the city looks at, we, we opted instead to maximize this transparency and frame uh, frame used through it to the creative student life within. So we changed the nature of the border, opening it all up along the perimeter. And we admired the, um, these massive granite sills, but they were just um, at shoulder height, they were just um, too massive and created the separation between inside and out. So we cut, we cut those out and designed new windows with a, um, with a low loungy sill height creating indoor outdoor seats at each, um, each individual bay. So we really like this idea that uh, somehow Parsons' desire to have a stronger presence in the city uh, could be accomplished by visually dissolving their facade uh, and lessening this distinction between inside and out. We attempted to undermine the border uh, to the point where it's less a division uh, that separates people than it is one that brings them together. Inside. Uh, we created opportunities for students to create the identity for the school for themselves at the urban scale on what we call uh, pedagogical billboards that wrap around each of these stair elevator cores, which you can see here. This is a fine arts student work here. And these change out periodically, so the identity is constantly updated. We had a kind of fold out uh, critique zone there at the most prominent corner of the school, so it's not only the design product, but also the design process that's put on uh, display to the public. Uh, we needed to have signage, uh, some kind of identifying element, and, uh, it, but the zoning ordinance for Fifth Avenue only allows one to have a 12-inch high letter, uh, so we took our four-foot high letters, extruded them 12 inches deep, and then turned them on their sides to uh, get around that and uh, create a kind of graphic canopy. 
the, the complex, this is uh, Fifth Avenue and 13th Street running across the top. The complex were four separate buildings, each with, unbelievably, each with a separate entry and no interconnectivity except through the trash alley right here. Um, so we put our heads together and did some really sophisticated diagramming that we do this all the time at, at our office. Uh, to locate the geographic center of the complex and realized that it was occupied by a one-story maintenance shed with 12-story buildings all around. So it was kind of this soft center that we related to the idea of a, the potential for to create a, a, a traditional campus quad, but one that accesses not only program around it, but also the elevators that uh, lift you up to all the other uh, floors. So the mascot became, for us, this papaya that uh, we scoop out the kind of uh, junky stuff in the middle uh, to expose the juicy uh, programmatic fruit around. And then the actual scooping out of that middle space uh, in what would be the quad here, the kind of after shot um, that, that's located here. So all the program spinning out around at the main gallery, archives, auditorium, more gallery space, orientation center, and that little uh, <coughs> critique zone on the corner all open really to the street. Uh, one, there was one quirky building in the four, uh, five-story uh, wood structure, so we uh, clad that in uh, uh, yellow poplar bark to kind of bring a little bit of nature in and resonate with that uh, wood structure. We covered the whole thing with a diagrid uh, glass roof that is supported by beams that come off the logic of both the 75th Avenue and then 66th Fifth Avenue, so they kind of interfinger, that's why the spacing is irregular. Uh, we joined 13th Street and 5th Avenue entries internally for the first time, uh, uh, 13th Street entry, 5th Avenue entry, and negotiated, I think it was 20 different uh, floor levels in the complex total, uh, which actually gave us a lot of opportunity um, spatially, but it was a, quite a challenge at the same time. This is that trash alley that uh, was running down the middle of the space. This wall uh, in the back is uh, after a picture here. We were left with little nooks and crannies that weren't really uh, programmed, so we uh, were able to uh, kind of on the fly say, hey, that would be an amazing meeting room. So, uh, and the university went along with these ideas, so we have a really popular meeting room here next to the gallery. Uh, most of the signage, I mean, we really uh, didn't want to apply signage to the project, so everything is really embossed uh, in the architecture. And we're very conscious of the dialectic between the um, existing buildings and the, and the new interventions and um, therefore we exposed the, exposed the exi existing structures throughout the, throughout the project to contrast that um, existing construction with a new, in this case, with a new driver construction of the gallery. And we conceptualized um, each programmatic component in relationship to the existing um, raw shell, either treating it as half shell, liner, box in a box, wrapper, um, so a different strategy for each programmatic element. And we worked oppor opportunistically to tease out the most out of, um, out of all the existing sectional variations that we, that we inherited. So that was, um, was pretty exciting to work with those different levels. Um, this, is, this is my um, favorite before shot. Um, it, it's a, a housekeeping closet that we realized um, would be perfectly positioned to have an overview over the future quad. So we just kind of levered it out a little bit and were able to, uh, to enlarge the space enough just to, um, to be able to make it a seminar room. So now it's the um, meeting part and you can, see, you can see here the contrast between the old and the new and how they support each other. From the street, the old gallery was completely embedded and we opened it up as, um, as the articulated box that you can see here. And you can also see the beams of the original building above the box and, and how uh, which offers a strength to the new construction. This new proscenium space between, between the gallery and the, um, and the street crea creates a close relationship between those two. Um, and in the, in the back of the gallery, we just tip up the, the, um, a lid of the box slightly, so you, you have um, a glimpse of the existing structure beyond. And there's, there's a walkway that winds around the shell of the gallery, um, winds between the shell and the gallery, 
um, and that provides data and power outlets. So there are no power and data outlets visible in the gallery proper. And there's just this little, um, this very small gap between the wall and the floor where you just um, drop in your, um, your cable and you can just plug it in from behind. In the auditorium, both the- It's like an extension of the space. <laughs> In the auditorium, both the bamboo shell and the real graphic, uh, real graphic wall are perforated to control the acoustics of the space. And at the front wall, we use the slate, slate wall that um, doubles as, as a blackboard and uh, helps to project the speaker's voice into the space. So this bamboo shell, you can see, is articulated as an insert that is lodged within the existing, within the wall shell. This room. bamboo shell, <laughs> this slate wall. <laughs> um, and in, in the archives, we created a sound absorbing liner um, that is a very low liner of help that, um, that keeps the ambient sound levels low. Um, and then the room is, is open to above, but the scale of the space is broken down by the, by the light fixtures, by the low light um, datum of the light fixtures. And by opening up the ground floor level, we needed to reroute all the systems that were going from the cellar to the upper floors. So we aggregated them um, in one location around an existing elevator core and wrapped it all in, in aluminum, um, aluminum mesh so that all the systems were semi-exposed, as you can see here. And finally, we really liked the idea of having a campus clock and really wanted to make that happen. And that's, um, and the new school actually has a very specific synchronized three hour class cycle. So we could create this countdown clock that when you see plus 13 minutes, you know that you're running quite late to class. Um, so enough with these renovations. We thought we, you know, it was time to do some amazing ground up work. So we did an open competition where the Museum of Polish History, uh, a kind of major project in uh, Warsaw. Uh, this is our, our site plan, but overlaid with uh, some of the site features. When we received the brief, we were uh, pretty shocked at uh, the kind of violent uh, cut that goes through this park that is quite historic and, 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 and quite beautiful with very uh, mature trees on all sides. They had just cut a highway uh, through that park. Uh, it, the site itself is here. Uh, bound by a historic castle, a cliff here, and then some historic and very tiny Swedish houses there. So uh, we, th the program suggested a quite monumental uh, structure uh, that is uh, even larger than the castle, but we felt this was really not uh, appropriate, so we proposed this kind of mending of the site by covering over uh, the highway, pushing uh, the building away from the castle and down into the earth and just allowing it to sprout out of the soil to, to gather the light. So a kind of a section diagram like this. So we looked at all these, but we thought with the castle, it really does not make sense. Uh, it was a practical idea to cut uh, for the museum, fill for the highway to cover that over. Uh, by pushing the building against the cliff, we allow for dual access from the upper park and the lower park. So uh, into the uh, indoor forum below and the outdoor forum above. Around that forum are situated these six pavilions or points, we call it six points. And you can see that incision in the landscape here for the indoor forum with the outdoor forum above. And then these six components, uh, entry, uh, history gallery, administrative and academic uh, uh, research tower, and a uh, more historic uh, gallery, Polish history gallery, uh, a temporary exhibition space, and then an education wing as well. Uh, so it comes together like this. These large oculi uh, glow with the light uh, from inside at night. The elements are all very low scaled in the park. And of course, in the day, they allow an uh, enormous amount of light into that indoor uh, forum space. The park itself folds down into that indoor forum uh, at this entry point here. We were really inspired by uh, Beacon and the experience. Uh, it's really amazing at night when you walk out onto the roof 
amongst these monitor skylights, and they're very, very low and glowing. It's a really uh, spatially amazing uh, experience, and we recreated that by making cuts through the roof of uh, one of the permanent galleries, uh, creating a kind of park maze. It's only seven feet high, so extremely uh, small scaled inside uh, the kind of inverted effect uh, a skylight coffer uh, for each gallery. We had a different strategy uh, here, um, a series of operable louvre uh, skylights. And in the contemporary or uh, temporary exhibition space, a series of light cells cut through the outdoor forum that just softly light the interior. And then that gallery frames a view uh, looking out over uh, the scarp to the city of uh, Warsaw. So it's, it's our own very, I think, very sensitive examination of the site uh, and the anticipation of the effects of such a large project on it that led us to subvert, in a way, our own ambition uh, to build a, a larger structure. And, and then on top of it, we didn't, we didn't win. You might guess a large unimass uh, structure situated exactly next to the castle did win. So between the castle and the highway, that was the scheme uh, that was selected. I'm not bitter, uh, but uh, fortunately, it doesn't look like uh, it's going to go ahead. So, so at uh, so MOOC had the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. It's, it's a project that we've just started working on. Um, it involves this very raw former car dealership by Albert Kahn and has been renovated many, many times. The city's main artery Woodward Avenue extends north from downtown as a cultural corridor leading up to the um, Detroit Institutes of, of the Arts. And Mocha is located in Midtown, which is currently being revitalized with new pedestrian green belt under construction through and around the neighborhood. And Mocha's robust art and events programming already resonates with the community and we see it as central to renewing the neighborhood um, as the as the project moves forward. Um, Mocket is located at the corner of, of Woodward and Garfield. And the museum is working to acquire the property to the south. And it already owns the property um, adjacent to it and to the, to the east and east-south. So they'll have this whole parcel. And we're working uh, in collaboration with James Corner Field Operations to develop the museum surrounds as a new garden for an expanded outdoor art and events programming. And we examined from a logical perspective different entry scenarios. And with the land acquired to the south, it actually, um, we actually have really good solar exposure to the south and east. And so it makes sense to shift the garden from the current north to, um, to the south side so you, you can enter the museum from the garden. Also, it was, it was clear that the current annual exhibition cycle for the museum, which is three major exhibitions paired with um, three, three short-term closures, doesn't really work for the museum anymore. So, um, yeah, Mohit currently just doesn't have enough preparatory space to be able to do the prep work and the exhibition at the same time. So we realized that we need additional space to make continuous um, operation possible um, and, and realized that we need about 30% more um, square footage. Aside from these steps, the list of desires from the client and users were contradictory and we can completely understand why. They wanted to preserve the gritty urban character of the space, but they also wanted a new contemporary identity. And they wanted to have a completely flexible space but yet somehow a space that was determined specifically for each use. So these conflicting desires, in a way, cancel out many possibilities. Um, but we were comforted by Henry Kissinger's observation that the absence of options brings with it great clarity. <laughs> and we did eliminate a lot of um, possibles through logic, which has made our path a lot more clear in, in a, lot, a lot of ways. Now, the, the building situated here, surrounded by parking lots, and those bound by two streets. So really, the, the, we, we didn't have much choice in where the garden would go. And it just is happy that it is on the south. So we extend that out. But we need this extra 30% to make the museum operate uh, effectively. 
uh, to give them some more preparatory space. Uh, Woodward Avenue here, Garfield here. So really, we couldn't we couldn't go north, east, south, or west. We couldn't go down. So really, the only direction to go was up. Uh, and then because we create this new nexus on the southeast corner, we privileged that mass and shifted it uh, to that corner, uh, being drawn to it at uh, a new entry point there. And then. Uh, because it's very difficult to build right on top of existing foundations, we offset that further to the southeast so those uh, footings would miss uh, the existing foundations. And then the whole building is set on a colonnade uh, that can be modified. Uh, this is just really a preliminary, but the diagram is that these columns can shift to encourage entry into specific locations around the facade. Uh, the good thing about that is that it defines an indoor-outdoor space for events up to 1,000 people. This program is central to MOCAD. They have a really robust uh, music program uh, and arts program. And they, they were very nervous. Uh, they wanted uh, a, a real identity for this space, a contemporary identity. But they uh, did not want to lose the gritty character of the space that they have uh, used for that in the past. So this, in a way, by overlaying the new structure through and threading it through to the existing uh, volume, uh, we achieve both uh, goals. The, the gallery space is pretty much where it is now. It's slightly reconfigured, uh, but it's in the raw uh, space. We've cut new connections to the street here, much like we did at Parsons, to bring uh, the community uh, views into the gallery. And then that uh, additional exhibition space on top, new support zones back here that allow the museum uh, to function better a new sculpture garden uh, on top of the roof as well. So it's this kind of culture hub is what we call the event space. And it's really the vital part of activity at MOCAD. And we want that to feel it's absolutely a part of the garden, an extension of the garden. Uh, so you can see here in that rendering uh, our vision of how uh, this mix, sorry, mix of uh, landscape, the colonnade, and the building kind of collage or compress onto one another uh, for any kind of events from concerts to film screens or car shows, everything considered uh, indoor, outdoor in a way. So the, the threshold becomes no longer the, the edge of the museum, but actually out into the garden, out to Canfield to the south, Garfield to the north, and to Woodward on the south. So this is just finishing a visioning phase and to go into schematics uh, sometime soon. So on a smaller scale and back to New York, we renovated a single, um, single floor of the McKimmedon White Carnegie li Library. These Carnegie libraries were built in the early part of the 20th century. And a lot of uh, those libraries in New York, are, or a lot of the third floors of these libraries in New York are often unused. This floor that uh, we were working on was abandoned as well. And it was a beautiful, lightful space. Um, so we set, ourself, uh, set for ourselves a generative rule, a no partition rule. We didn't want to clog up the space. So we said that whatever we do to break it down, to break the scale down, it had to be done, done without adding any walls. So we relied on independent programmatic elements to keep the space open and organized, to keep the space slide filled, but also to unhide these teenagers and to <laughs> Um, so that they interact with one another and to encourage hanging out. Each of those elements addressed the zone around them without having any walls. And these, uh, these bleachers um, here give the space a bit of a sectional variation. We stepped up the opposite bookcases and dropped the ceiling in the middle, so you have this inverted valley in the middle. Um, the L-bracket seating in the middle is, is movable for performances, and so this, the darker zone in, that in, in the middle of the space um, has the ideal condition for, for, uh, for projection. And so with that, for film screenings, poetry readings, and Lee contests or so. Comp compositionally, for the facade, McKimmed and White had, um, had raised the sills to about seven <coughs> feet above the floor. So the, so the bleachers now actually allow the kids to go up and look out of those windows. And now the kids can just hang out or use those bleachers um, as performance space. The media vitrine really inverts the normative idea of what a media room usually um, was thought to, to be. Um, these are rooms where kids come and play, Guitar Hero, Wii, etc. 
all the loud interactive systems that, that teenagers like, like to engage in. And they're typ typically hidden away in very enclosed ancillary spaces. So, but instead we wanted to put on display the physicality of these activities and literally showcase them. And it actually worked. We specified these holosonic speakers that project the sound straight down uh, rather than dispersing the sound like with, with normal conical speakers. And if you're standing directly under the spe speaker array, it's very loud. But if you're just standing next to it, just to the side of it, it's not, it's not loud at all. So you can see those kids going crazy inside the media vitrine and others um, just having quiet conversations or reading books just outside. And in general, we try to keep the, um, the scale down more in line with the users and try to keep all the bookcases low um, and then wrap the space with a constellation graphic and a graphic wall um, both that both enliven the space and help to break down its scale. Uh, I referred to this project uh, at the beginning of the, the talk. Um, we were invited with uh, 99 other architects by the artist Ai Weiwei and Herzog and Amiron to propose a 10,000 square foot villa in Inner Mongolia. Uh, our site was uh, 007 here on the perimeter. Um, and it wasn't really true that we had nothing to go on. I mean, we're located in the desert and we wanted to privilege uh, uh, the landscape in a way and internalize it into the house by pushing it into the domestic environment by responding to the, the south orientation uh, for solar and uh, kind of lopping off the top of the building. Uh, it's very uh, cold there in the winter, but we were still left feeling kind of set adrift without a client or any kind of idiosyncratic requirements. Uh, and we started thinking about the idea of this unplanned journey uh, of the situationist idea of the derive, and we wondered if we could encourage in our architecture kind of unconscious acts of domestic migration uh, and we thought we could do that by, in a way, democratizing the domestic environment so that every space is one uh, where you could cook or crash or uh, relax or entertain. So really, no level for sleeping uh, in particular, no level for living or entertaining. There, all those functions are interspersed uh, throughout uh, uh, the project. The lower level does tend to be an active level. We incise that uh, into the landscape. Uh, lab pool, sauna, workout area. That's the first level where these uh, garden voids uh, push into uh, the house. It's connected uh, via what we call a kind of super slow stair. It's a, just an extremely large, uh, what we think of as a vertical room where uh, you're maybe a little less conscious of uh, flowing from one space to the next. It's really a glorified <laughs> spiral stair, but it's about 20 feet across, so it's quite large for a house. Uh, and those uh, kind of nature voids really set up the spatial conditions uh, inside. And we use the uh, very volumetric approach where the spaces are created between internal volumes and those nature voids. Uh, and also between the volumes and the exterior shell and between the volumes uh, themselves. And then finally on the, the roof, the top living level has uh, a, a green roof with uh, of end of the nature void opening to the sky. And now some even smaller scale works. This is an exhibition that, that we designed for Stephen Hall Museum just outside of Seattle. It was a show that featured the work of um, compelling contemporary fashion designers. And it was divided into five curatorial sections. Again, like at the teen center, uh, we made a speculative rule for ourselves. Um, we prohibited one of the most popular, but what we thought most annoying um, elements of fashion exhibition, and that's the mannequin. Um, so for, for some sections, we did not have access to physical garments at all. So um, for example, this Victor and Rolf nested doll dress, we only had images of it, and so we designed an apparatus where visitors could see the detail of the garment. The panels could fold against the custom light box, to examine the detail, but they could also flip out to show the dresses many layers in relationship to one another. <coughs> Victor and Rolf also created a blue screen, dress, blue screen dress series that they staged in a line of dresses superimposed with stock videos of contemporary life, like planes taking off, cars on a highway. Um, so we recreated this condition 
with this U-turn runway, which incorporated a live um, blue, screen, blue screen apparatus. This long table here was created for a group of designers whose work was critical of the fashion industries. Their, their work did not have too much to do with, the, um, with how the garment looks, but rather um, what they had to say about the industry. So in response, we created the split light examination table with, which illuminate, illuminated the garments from above and below. We built specimen containers for the science section to focus on the technology of garment and fabric. We obscured most of the garments so you could not see their form or shape in totality. Um, but you win those some with magnifying lenses would just focus on the detail of fabrics within them, um, obscuring the whole and just emphasizing the part. For the spectacle section, we filmed an Alexander McQueen show from multiple viewpoints and then then we created the show virtually in the gallery to manufacture the sense that you can never experience everything um, simultaneously. So each screen documents a unique perspective, so viewers are constantly turning around, uh, trying to avoid missing something. And finally, in the structure section, which featured Martin Magella's flat panel series and Kawakubo's bump series, we had to invent a flexible apparatus that could work with both extremely thick and extremely thin rocks. So these express collapsible displays here fully expand for the bump dresses and compress for the flat panel dresses. And where we did refer to the body, we did so by using photographs or video of garments on actual humans rather than mannequins. And we also diagrammed garment structures and concepts and detailed how um, physically to support the garments so that they would float in those cases. And next are two works um, which on which we collaborated with artist Ben Rubin. We, in this case, we worked together um, on the New York Times lobby art project. Our version, unfortunately, didn't make it. Um, but Ben, ben um, completed um, a beautiful work on his own. The first, our first iteration, and as, as it turned out, it was it was way too expensive. Uh, was for a kinetic, uh, was for a kinetic sculpture that consisted of columns of virtual text that were only revealed by these scanning devices that tracked up and down the mullions in a choreographed dance, mining the information that they displayed from the Times database. So it's all about the day's news, intentionally taken out of con context and recombined. These LED displays scroll text in one direction at the same speed that the display units are actually moving in the opposite direction, so making the display text stand still. So the invisible content is revealed through the movement of these computer control de devices. At the end of each day, these units are put to sleep and allowed to dream by periodically waking up to display not the day's news, but news from the past, content that is mined from the Times vast archive. That's actually a, uh, a part of our idea that was realized in the final product, so we're uh, thrilled that that made it in. Uh, the next project that we collaborated on with Ben Rubin, along with Lisa Straussfeld, was for a uh, public artwork uh, for the Fulton Street Transit Hub, uh, which is now being completed in Lower Manhattan. Uh, uh, Jamie Carpenter won this project, sadly we did not. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Misconnections from Craigslist. It's a personal ads, um, no one's that sad. Uh, but it's actually, uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great thing. It's like when you're on a subway and you're sitting there and you make eye contact with the person across from you and I don't know, this chemistry happens and things are starting to gel. Uh, but then one of you get off without you know, getting each other's digits and you realize when the subway door closes that that that's, could be the one. And uh, so you, you go back and, you, and they compose these beautifully uh, written, uh, poetic, I would say, uh, descriptions of the encounter, where and when they happened in the hopes that the other person is also online looking at Craigslist in the misconnections uh, category. So our hope by it was to make these, uh, these pleas, these last uh, ditch efforts more public in a way and to put them on display at the transit hub and all of them, all the connections would happen based on uh, misconnections happening in the uh, transit system. 
So the three components were this dome space, which is really the kind of uh, high volume, uh, high turnover space, a day street concourse, which is also a fairly transient space, and then the subway platforms themselves, which are really more about stasis. And we looked at the apparatus uh, that we were proposing for each of these in terms of the receptivity, the amount of time, the amount of tension uh, that would be given to them. In the, in the uh, dome space, again, you have very uh, quick uh, observation, no time to really read about it. But we, so we just give a two-word headline uh, for this incoming misconnection with the time and date stamp. And that's all uh, connected directly with Craigslist. So it's live, happening live. Uh, these things building up and being displayed um, immediately. And then in the Day Street Concourse, a single line of uh, a split flap display uh, mounted to the wall uh, gives uh, a, a longer uh, but slightly delayed version of the same thing. And then in the, on the subway platforms, uh, a kind of best of these poetic uh, encounters or uh, pleas online, uh, hard copies printed on subway grade panels. Uh, this is actually one that we fabricate for an exhibition sponsored by the Whitney. We couldn't leave the project without uh, kind of trying to manufacture a misconnection. So on the subway platform, we created these uh, stillness areas. Uh, and in the middle, uh, a kind of alarm with a frame. So when you stand and plan now, uh, opposite from someone in these stillness areas, if you're both there for more than 10 seconds, little alarm goes off in the middle, uh, frame lights up, and uh, you, you see this uh, stranger uh, suddenly, uh, but fortunately you have a time date stamp, so when you go online you can try to, to, to link up. Uh, this next to the last project, um, I don't know if you know the Votomatic uh, voting machines, but they were the hanging Chad machines used in Florida's uh, 2000 presidential election. It kind of changed the course of the election through uh, its dysfunction. Uh, so they were all retired, and a curator uh, in New York got a hold of a bunch of them and asked a bunch of artists and architects to do something with them for an exhibition on democracy. Uh, we, we didn't want to make a planter out of it or anything like that, so uh, we, uh, we decided to extend its life as a voting instrument uh, and amplify its dysfunction, but uh, in very particular ways uh, to uh, respond to cultural demographics around the country. So it would basically ensure uh, culturally consistent results. So we uh, named it uh, Bias Brand, uh, Reconditioned uh, Voting Booths. Uh, we made one model, which is this rifle, uh, breakdown rifle. Um, uh, that cultural uh, or market epicenter was for Hunt, Hunt County, Texas. Uh, you can see a very conservative environment, but this is uh, good. Uh, this is an instrument that is familiar with rural conservatives, hunters, sportsmen. Uh, and so uh, the ballot is really the target uh, where you shoot for your candidate. Um, a number here you can see conservatives are allowed to shoot from 50 yards away. Liberals are made to shoot from 100 yards away. So it's a little more difficult to, uh, for them to vote correctly, a mock-up of one of the ballots. Uh, in all fairness, we went to Berkeley, California, created the Zen Zone uh, model for that uh, market, uh, where it includes a yoga mat, a set of candles, a uh, timer here. Uh, conservatives are, uh, liberals can vote right away. Conservatives are asked to meditate for 60 minutes prior to casting their <laughs> vote by lighting a candle for their candidate. Uh, for those annoying uh, states that uh, are the swing states, yeah, swing states. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, if you're annoyed with your state, you can try to get it off the fence by gambling away your votes, um, getting up to 35 votes for your uh, your uh, one vote, if you're lucky. And uh, we had to do one for New York, uh, the capitalist elite, based on an ATM where you can buy or sell your vote. Uh, <laughs> if you feel disenfranchised, uh, you can sell. And if you're loaded, you can, of course, buy as many votes as you can afford uh, with a little ticker with the current value of each uh, candidate. <laughs> so the last project we'll, um, we'll share tonight is, is a um, garden pavilion created for the Philbrook Art Museum in Oklahoma. <coughs> they have a beautiful newly constructed grounds and through a com um, competition commissioned a series of temporary garden pavilions. And we quickly realized that we only had about the 
about a quarter of the money that we needed to build the entire pavilion. So we decided to just build the most effective but least expensive quarter of the pavilion. And what we were left with was a head shell that serves as a viewing device and that is adaptable to various terrains. So we experimented with different sites on the museum grounds. Essentially the installation is an elevated box that does not have any door. So visitors have to duck, um, duck to get in, inside of it. And then they look through pairs of mirrors that recombine the landscape. The back is a sky viewer that has a full, full width mirror mounted on a 45 degree angle to frame and multiply the sky view. And here's the amazing image of how we first imagined the mirroring effects to be, but that's unfortunately that's just Photoshop and not real life. So and the optics not just did not, at all. yeah, the it's optics just didn't close. work this way. <laughs> well, it worked if you held your, we built a tiny mock up and hold it up against the screen and that worked because there, the, yeah. the, the view. There's no perspectival recession. Yeah. It's all completely flat. We were so excited. <laughs> So we had to um, we had to build mockups and um, get out there on site and and really test um, and identify um, an appropriate site and and set it there. So in this installation photo, you can see that that only this only the right hand um, bit is an is actual view, and then the one next to it is a mirrored view, and the next to it doubly doubly mirrored, triply mirrored, and yeah. Um, so the viewer, the viewer takes what is, what is essentially an object or landscape and manufactures a fictional view of that landscape, a, a fake that raises the awareness of the original. For example, one can hear on one side, on, on the left side, um, you can hear the waterfall behind those mirrors, but then you see it on the far right. And looking back into the hillside of the sky view, one would expect to see the opposite landscape but instead you see the sky and the tree canopy above. And here's an overview, um, an overview that shows the contrasting horizontal form of the viewer itself registering the topography of the landscape below. So uh, that's about it for this evening. Um, I hope through this wide range of projects, we've been able to uh, demonstrate in a way our focus on designing how projects operate, what they actually do. Uh, fundamentally, we enjoy working tactically uh, and using project uh, restrictions to our own architectural advantage. And we do that by working to understand the very performative nature of programmatic relationships. Through active propositional readings of program, we seek to disrupt the normative, both by identifying uh, desires unarticulated in the programmatic brief uh, and by speculating on their performative potential. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. Happy to take any questions. Yep. Okay. So it seems you guys have worked with uh, several other disciplines. You know, you said you worked with Arab, you worked with It's revealed to us the narrowness of our profession and the kind of way architects are trained to think about problems, especially, as I mentioned with Bob, working with artists, like, hey, why, why do we need a building? We're like, what? What do you mean? Why do you need a building? We're architects because that's what we do. Um, uh, so I think working with Ben or, you know, we've worked with a botanist, I mean, it's like these, um, these people also have a real focus in their work and to share in their focus, it just kind of expands your world. Uh, so you, you do see projects from a different perspective and I think that's, that's the rewarding uh, part of it. And you gain expert, expertise along the way working with mechanical engineers and thinking about how things can be solved and you, you become a little more savvy. It kind of builds up your potential arsenal, I guess, of, of things that you can do. Uh, and um, so I think with Without that also, you have to recognize your own limitations 
as architects and the limited amount of knowledge you have and really give yourself over in a way to an acoustician, uh, as, uh, acoustician as we did at, at uh, Parsons. And we, we basically had the idea of perforation uh, and we wanted to calibrate that both for acoustics. So we said we're gonna randomize the perforations in the sidewall, uh, but we need an acoustician to tell us how much, how many uh, perforations. So we gave him all the architectural uh, ideas and then he told us how much of that we needed and then we deployed it on the sidewall. So it's, it's a really kind of wonderful uh, relationship. I, I can't complain about any consultant we really had except for cost consultants. But I think you, <laughs> I think you also um, realize that you have to push, you have to push into the realm of the, of the other, like you, um, and, and allow others to push in your direction. Like I think yeah. what, what Lynn mentioned, that, that example of, um, of Bob, um, suggest making suggestion, suggestions about the architecture and, and the valid, valid suggestions about the architecture and, and you have to yeah, you have to step back and see that yeah sometimes they sometimes they, they are right but you also have to push you have to push out and not just expect from a, for example a structural engineer to solve every uh, to solve the structure but you have to go out there and you have to to have to make suggestions and and really push and collaborate basically collaborate right. on, on everything. Well, I think I, I think the first the, the um, question about the campus. I think we saw we saw it more as a campus within that within those buildings, not as a campus for the entire new school or entire Parsons, but just this um, these four different buildings that are grouped around it that were completely separated. It was it used to be that it's just four buildings adjacent to one another, and you had to go out. I mean, it, if you didn't want to go through the trash alley. So now I think it does. It does work that it brings. It really brings those buildings together and makes that one little campus. But, but you're asking not, about the the kind of yeah. larger, the larger. Yeah, yeah. it's a pro. I mean, Astrid is a thesis advisor at Parsons, and you know she teaches a block away, but it's still Parsons. So yeah, I think the unification of the whole campus isn't hasn't happened. And I think the the new school is constantly trying to evolve the campus. But in New York, it's all about real estate and trying to get those. They do try to accumulate properties next to each other, but it'll never, I don't think it'll ever be together. And the new building that Roger uh, designed is, um, I mean, it, in a way it represents the problematic of designing an enormous building in that neighborhood that try, does try to bring a lot of functions together. And, and I think there's, there, there was a lot of resistance to that project because of its scale in the neighborhood, and it's certainly a different scale than our project. Um, but I, I mean, we, we don't know, we just know the building from, the, we can just trust the building's exterior. We don't really know the building from inside. And I, I, I still have the hope that that can actually, that can somehow work as some kind of campus, that that really brings the, um, brings Parsons together. And that is something where all students from all the different buildings around it really plug in and, and um, so that that is basically will become the main hub. Hmm. But, uh, I don't know. I mean, I hope yeah. that it will. Sure. I have a question about the last project. Does it seem like it really flipped everything? You know, as though there's a different kind of a promise there or a different kind of future potentially for the work. And, and what I mean is all the others, at least, you know, I'm trying to make sure I got this right. And I bet I didn't. But, there's a kind of very fresh, direct, simple, um, we're not trying to trick anybody. There, there's nothing here where we're being a satanic or clever, <coughs> just being really smart hmm. and attentive to the problem at hand, and that sort of thing, which is wonderful, and I think really effective. But 
this project is deliberately perplexing hmm. and tricky and confusing and um, uh, you know intellectually uh, uh, involuted in all sorts of ways. Hmm. So it surprised me at the end. And, and I wonder if you agree or if uh, there's anything to that. Well, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, I can understand that. It's a little bit of a, you know, anytime you use mirror, uh, you know, you're called into question, I think. it's it's, And we also, we were like, really, mirror? Um, but, you know, it's, it's an installation that we thought we had the opportunity for uh, not a lot of money to, uh, to disrupt the normative. So in a way, it is consistent with a lot of the other uh, goals that we've had with our work. So... The idea that the recombining of the landscapes uh, that could give you a kind of fictional stitching together of the landscapes, it, the effect when you're there uh, is really, it was more environmentally, uh, more environmental than the still photos would kind of make it seem. And there is one thing we didn't really emphasize because we didn't really show the project, it does frame the actual landscape right in front of you. But then the borders, extend uh, infinitely. So it's that kind of infinite mirroring of the landscape that was part of the interest of it, but mainly just that when you look left, you're seeing right. And in the confusion, I think, of what's happening, there is the opportunity to kind of look or examine that landscape more carefully. So I don't know, I, I thought it was provocative in that way, um, but I guess it was a little bit of a crowd pleaser as well. I mean, people kind of like to duck under and get in and, and use it as a viewing device. But, uh, and I think that our first take on it where we thought that these landscapes would be perfectly aligned, for us it was an educational experience to understand that the world is not flat. I mean, it seemed like the most basic thing, but actually when we mocked it up, we realized that these, actually the horizon lines do not align uh, when they're mirrored like that. So. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a valid concern, uh, but that's the approach for us was consistent with the, the rest of our work. I think it's also there's something too that that we have these really complex projects, um, and we usually try to clarify and and sort sort things out, clarify, and make them make them visible, understandable, and and in this case there was basically nothing. Go and so I think we just here we added complexity as opposed to taking away the complexity or taking mm. away the 